So our great hymn of the church this evening is what is traditionally known as a Negro spiritual. This particular hymn was first published in 1907, appearing in the hymnal Folk Songs of the American Negro. Now, today we refer to these songs as African American spirituals, or simply spirituals. This song found its origin in 1756 when a uh, black slave asked a Presbyterian minister by the name of William Davies how he could become a Christian. Simply said, I want to be a Christian. Uh, the wording that comes to us is, I don't come to you, sir, said the slave, that you may tell me some good things concerning, or I said, that you may tell me some good things concerning Jesus Christ and my duty to God. For I am resolved not to live any more as I have done. Sir, I want to be Christian. Now, there are two other interesting facts pertaining to this spiritual. The original text said, in my heart, I in hyphen my, in my, or I in hyphen my, in my heart. So it wasn't sung. In fact, interestingly enough, this was a song that we often sang as I was a child in camp meeting. Now, we didn't sing it in church, but we would sing it at the altar in camp meeting. When somebody would come to the altar or give their lives to Christ, or we'd be what we would call um, interceding for what was considered a breakthrough. We would be praying, and someone would spontaneously just go into the hymn. In my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian. In my heart. And we would sing this. So it's sort of ingrained in me as a child, this beautiful spiritual song. Now what's interesting is over the years, we've dropped that. And we just simply say, Lord, I want to be a Christian. And then the fourth verse, they left out. And they put, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus in my heart. But originally, the fourth verse, which I had Nikki sing for you tonight, was, I don't want to be like Judas in my heart. Now, certainly, we want to be like Jesus in our hearts. And the church said, Amen. But to leave this verse out, in my mind, it like cuts out the guts of the song. Because we have come to an age that doesn't believe there's a literal Satan and probably questions whether there's a literal Judas as we think of him. But the songwriter understood something. And it's probably come to us through tradition tradition because we don't know who wrote the song and I suspect verses has been have been added over the years before it was published in 1907 but what the songwriter grasped is there is a Judas in all of us and we can yield to it or we can say no to it seriously think about this for a moment what is it that messes up our Christian walk? Take 20 seconds. Talk to your neighbor about it. What is it that messes up our Christian walk? Go ahead. I'll watch you. It's good to have you home, John and Cheryl and the rest of you that were serving over there in the northern part of our state. <laughs> we followed you on Facebook. Good work. So what did you come up with? What is it that messes up our Christian walk? What is it? Sin. Sin. Uh, that's kind of broad stroke. Let's get a little more specific. Self. Self. Pride. 
flesh. Yeah, we're getting really close now. Let's, that starts with an E and it ends with an O. What's it called? Let's say it together. Ego, absolutely. See, I don't want to be a Judas in my heart. Why? Because Judas feeds the what? Ego. It's what I want my way to my glory. That's the Judas. But the Christian is, it's his way, his will, to whose glory? His glory. See, none of us like authority. None of us like authority. Let's be honest. You know, we don't want someone to tell us what to do. Yet, without it, we perish. Remember the verse last week? Proverbs 28, verse 19. When we looked at that ancient hymn of the church, Be Thou My Vision, 8th century Gallic hymn. Based on him being our vision, we looked at Proverbs 29, 18 that says, without a vision, the people perish. Literally, that word perish in the Hebrew is cast off restraint. In other words, like the book of Judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's what happens when a, when a nation perishes. A family perishes. A community, per, a community perishes. Is we do whatever we want. Whatever we think is right in our own eyes. And hence there's a Judas in all of us. But all of us need a covering. I recall a, um, a young man, talented, gifted young man, who um, felt that his church didn't know how to do church. So he decided to start a church to make sure everybody knew that his church didn't know how to do church. And so instead of coming under authority, the authority of his pastor and the board, he decided to come under his own authority. Whenever we walk out of authority, by the way, we walk into our own, which is usually disastrous. So he walked out from underneath his covering, underneath that authority, started his own church, and seven years later, that's God's number of completion, the church died. None of us wants to admit it, but there's a Judas in all of us, and that's why God has given us a covering. Stay under it, and you'll not shipwreck. Walk from under it, and you'll become your own covering, the result of which will be titanic, is always the case. We come under the, the covering of God. It's our protection. As wives, we come under the covering of our husbands. It's protection. As sheep, we come under the covering of the shepherd. It's protection. We walk out from underneath of it come a law unto ourselves, and it's dangerous. I recall when um, I felt led to start the Gloucester County Community Church. Remember it as clearly as could be. It's New Year's Eve. I'm driving from Pittman, where my parents lived, to Pleasantville, and heard God, it was though he were sitting right next to me. Just say, Bruce, I want you to go back to your hometown, start a church. I'm second graduating class, by the way, of Washington Township. In those days, we graduated a little over 120 until South Philly migrated. And now, you know, we graduate eight to 900. But in those days, we were basically a, a farming culture, Presbyterians and Methodists. You know, we didn't have the Roman Catholic population that we have today in townships, altogether different. And I just so clearly remember God saying to me, I want you to go to your hometown and start a church. And the first thing that came to my mind is, well, I can't do this without Dr. Huber's approval. He's the one that God used to place me into the ministry. Certainly, he's the one I want to bless me into ministry. 
And I remember going to him. I, I, I was actually a little fearful because I wasn't quite sure how he was going to respond. And I said, you know, Gene, I just really feel God wants me to go back to my hometown and start a church. And I said, I, I can't go without your blessing. So uh, would you pray about it? And he said, well, give me three months. And um, after the three months, uh, we sat down and talked. And he said, well, Bruce, I, I don't want you to leave. I, I feel you're an asset to the church. But I, I have to believe that you have heard the Lord. And um, you're, you're loosed. And seven months later, um, six actually and a half months later, GCCC held its first service. Gene was our first speaker at the anniversary. And I remember him standing in the pulpit. There was 126 people present. We didn't average 126, but there was 126 for that anniversary Sunday. And tears were streaming down his face. And he looked at me and he said, now I understand. A covering. It's always God's protection. We don't want to be Judas's in our hearts. Now here's what the songwriter understood. Judas' betrayal was a condition of the heart. So hence he says, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Where? In my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving. Where? In my heart. I want to be more holy. Where? All right, you can do a little better than that. I want to be more holy. I don't want to be like Judas. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Someone has penned these words. Follow me. A Christian is a mind through which Christ thinks. A heart to which Christ loves. A voice through which Christ speaks. A hand through which Christ helps. Let's say that together, shall we? A mind through which Christ thinks. A heart through which Christ loves. A voice through which Christ speaks. A hand through which Christ helps. Lord, let us be Christians not just in speech, but in heart and action. And for those who are here tonight who have yet to make that decision, may this be their night of new birth. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So our text is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Turn with me if you would. The best way to find 2 Peter is to go to Revelation and back up. Revelation, Jude... Then you've got 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, and you're where you need to be, all right? You're at Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, and read this with me. You've been sitting for a while. Let's stand, and we'll read it. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So how do we avoid the Judas that wants to work within our hearts that rises up against the will of the Lord? We stand upon the precepts of God, looking for him to be the master of our hearts. And hence, this great hymn of the church, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. And I would like us tonight to look at four pillars to sustained, prosperous ministry. And God has called every one of us to ministry. There's not a one here that he hasn't called to ministry in some way or another. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're the mind of Christ, as we saw. You're the hands of Christ. You have been called to ministry in some way or another. There are no exceptions. So hence we look at these four pillars 
to sustained, prosperous ministry. And these are the four, I've adapted them, that I shared um, this week with the um, ordination graduates of the ECA. And I want to thank you for your prayers. Uh, we had an absolute marvelous time. We were in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, um, where there, uh, 20, uh, I should say 17 graduates, 12 of whom were Korean, by the way. I wonder if the Koreans aren't going to evangelize our country as it continues to go in the wrong direction. But there were, and then there were a number of chaplains who were ordained. Um, 10 of the spouses came. So there were 27. It was absolutely a lovely sight. And I had the honor of bringing the keynote address on Thursday evening to those graduates. And you're getting a sort of a portion of that in terms of us walking in our Christian life in ministry, sustaining what God has called us to as we serve him. I have some slides. I'll show you that and then we can be seated. Um, these were the uh, 17 um, candidates or graduates for ordination. And then this is a slide of them with their spouses. Um, on Wednesday night, Ruth Graham, uh, there's Ann and Ruth, one of Billy Graham's daughters spoke. And then on the um, night that I spoke, uh, Huntley Brown, he's a Jamaican, is the key of the uh, pianist for Billy Graham. He does the specials and he was there. And I didn't, hadn't, hadn't had a chance to hear him play, so I called an audible. I said, can I call an audible? Elijah asked for the musicians before he preached. So uh, uh, Huntley played a, a song that just blew us all away. We could have all gone home after that. But anyway, thank you for your prayers. You may be seated and let me give you these four pillars to being and remaining prosperous in ministry. Now let me define prosperous. By prosperous, I don't mean what we think of when we hear the word, the word in a worldly context, which is what we accumulate and acquire that gives us fame and recognition. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about everything we need to accomplish his calling and his purposes in our life. That's prosperous. When God gives you everything you need, to accomplish his will, his way to his glory. That's prosperous. Furthermore, I use the words being and remaining in ministry because so many begin. They begin in service of the Lord. They come to a church, they're excited, they're Christians. They say, oh yeah, I'll help in Sunday school or I'll help in the nursery or I'll do this, I'll do that. And then before you know it, you know, the cares of the world come and they drop out. I tell our interns all the time, anybody can start a church. Let me see if it's there 30 years later. We're talking about beginning and completing, remaining and being prosperous in ministry. So here's the first point. Number one, keep the main thing the main thing. Let's say that together. Keep the main thing the main thing. What is the main thing? Yes, I think we're going to have a literary class. And then I'm going to give you all eyeglasses so you can read it with me. What is it? Love God by being a student of the book and a person of prayer. That's the main thing. Knowing who he is. And that will never happen. If you're not a person of the book and a person of prayer. The book is God speaking to you and prayer is you speaking to God. You've got to keep the main thing the main thing. There's no substitute for a personal Bible reading and prayer. No substitute. If we don't have a consistent personal time with the Lord, what we share with others is passionless. It comes from somebody else. What we share needs to come from ourselves. We want to be a Christian in my heart. So what you share needs to come from your heart. Hence, it has passion. It'll change lives. If you're just regurgitating what somebody, regurgitating what somebody else gave you, it's passionless. 
has to come from you. That's why we meet with God. That's why we pray. That's why we read. Because it's fresh. It lives within us. Remember what the scripture says in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was fresh. Passion. Number two. Say it with me. Now the but is number three, and we'll get there in a moment. But the first is love people. Love people. We'll get to the but in just a moment. Programs may put people in the pew or a particular ministry for a season, but they don't change lives. Only love changes lives. Listen. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now hope is better than faith. Why is that? Because hope is the demonstration of faith. Why do you keep praying? Because you have hope that God's going to answer your prayer. Why do you remain faithful? Because you have hope that God's going to remove, reward your faithfulness. So the reason God put these in order is he exactly knows what it is he's doing. He says there's faith and then there's hope, which is the demonstration of faith. And then there's love, which is the essence of who I am. And the church said, Amen. I'll give you an illustration of this. Love people. My first secretary um, had or has a Jewish background. She had two little kids and her husband left her with these two little kids. Down the street was a church, church of those born againers, you know what I mean? And when they found out that her husband had left and left her with these two little kids, they would come by and every week they would deliver groceries and just tell her that Jesus loved her. Well, at first she was resistant, but she needed the groceries, so she took them. And then little by little, she began to be won over by these people who demonstrated the love of Christ with the kindnesses of meeting her needs. And she began to go to the church. And I think it took her almost two, if not two and a half years, till she finally believed that there was a Jesus who loved her and died for her and gave her life to Christ. My very first secretary. How was she won? Because somebody demonstrated the love of Christ. Just didn't talk about it. Demonstrated it. See, the word will not return void. But the word does not sit independent of works. James said, show me a man's faith and I'll show you his works. Show me a man's faith and I'll show you his works. Love is always demonstrated by action. Say that with me. Love is always demonstrated by action. Number three, love people. Now here's the but, finish it. Guard your, heart. Guard your hearts. Now, this is how Young's literal translation reads. I want to read it to you. Above, read it with me. Above every charge, keep thy heart. For out of it are the outgoings of life. We've learned it probably from the NIV, which, is, which says, above everything else, or above all, guard your heart, because out of it flow the issues of life. And it's true. It's very easy to, in ministry, get emotionally attached to a person needing fixing. Because about everybody in society today needs fixing. Now, if you talk to my mom's generation, she doesn't quite agree with that because in her generation, nobody needed fixing. 
But in our generation, everybody needs fixing. And the church said, Amen. I'm sure they needed fixing in our generation too. And that's why God gives those of us who are shepherds. And you will be a part of that as Christians. Fulfilling the mission of the body of Christ. Gives us the mission of Ezekiel 34. Which is the strength in the weak. Bind up the bruised and the broken. Put healings in the, healing in the body of the sick. Bring home the backslidden. And save the lost. That's the call of every pastor. Strengthen the weak, bind up the bruised and the broken, put healing in the bodies of the sick, save the lost, and bring home the backslidden. Now, what often happens is this. A person pours his or her heart out to you, and you want to be everything that person's job, employer, family, or spouse isn't. Why? Because you're a fixer. God fixed you, well, he's fixing you. You're not quite there yet. None of us will be quite there yet until we've got a glorified body and in heaven. Are you, are you in agreement with me there? Uh, I'm glad to hear that. So here's what happens. Somebody comes to you and they don't have enough money. What's your first inclination? Come on. To give it to them. Cause why? You're a fixer. And it sort of meets your emotional need. But maybe that isn't what you should be doing. Maybe God has a different plan so that they can fix their problem and that's what he wants you to do. Let's say a person comes and you know their job condition is lousy. What's your first inclination? Find them a new job. Why? Because you're a fixer. Yes. He or she doesn't get along with the family. What's your first inclination? Make a call to a family member. Be the moderator, the mediator, and fix it. Let me tell you, if I've learned anything in 31 years, I say the heck out of family dis <laughs> um, <laughs> disputes. Because you never win. Ever. Ever. If you don't hear any, yes, if you don't hear anything else, don't get involved in somebody else's family disputes. That's for the police. <laughs> Stay out of it. You'll never win. That's so hard to, to, to learn. Now let me speak to the guys for a moment. All you men who are here tonight, it's good to see you. Glad you're not out fishing somewhere. I'm glad you're in church. You can fish tomorrow if you're in church today. If you're a guy, and let's say Ms. A comes to you and she just pours out her heart. I mean, she tells you everything her husband isn't or everything that's wrong in her life. And you're becoming sympathetic, if not empathetic. And what happens? What are, what are we guys? Come on. Starts with an F, ends with an R. Fixer, that's correct. I'm glad that I should have given you the number of letters in that word. But anyway, we're fixers. That's what we are. So what do we want to do? We want to fix it. We want to be everything that person just spilled to you and wants to happen. And it's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Say that with me. It is dangerous. And whenever you become a whenever ear, you're really in trouble. You know what I'm talking about? When you are accessible to someone who has a need, whenever, then you have, you have removed the boundaries that protect you and that person. And you are in serious trouble. God has put boundaries on everything he's created. Everything. Including when you are, when somebody comes to you in terms of needing help. 
put boundaries on that. Listen, read it with me. Yes, love people. Come on, but understand that love protects God's reputation, the person's reputation you are called to love, and your own. One more time. You ought to write it down. It'll keep you out of trouble. Yes, love people. Now there's that but. Now whenever you see a but with one T, it is <laughs> redefining what went before it. It's qualifying it. Yes, love people, but now he's going to qualify the love. Understand, come on, that love protects God's reputation, the person's reputation you are called to love, and your own. I'm convinced that when people in ministry blow it, they get involved in the wrong people, or they're married and they wound up falling into a fair. And it was never their intent. They didn't get involved with that person intentionally thinking that, wow, we're going to be an item. No. The woman may, has the, the, the spouse, this is what I see typically. The spouse needs her emotional, has emotional needs that need to be met. So she'll typically, you know, bury herself and her children. And they'll meet the needs. Because the husband's working 14-hour days or whatever. And, you know, they're talking in the morning. And then at night she's too tired because she spent the whole day with the kids. And they don't meet each other's emotional needs. Now, we are going to find a way to meet our emotional needs. That's a given. One way or another, you're going to have your emotional needs met or you won't survive. So, you know, the, the wife finds a place to meet her emotional needs. The man finds a place to meet his emotional needs. And the couple start to do this and they don't even know it. Somebody steps into their life and gives them time. And all of a sudden your emotional needs are met. You had no intention of doing wrong. But before you know it, it's taking you down the wrong path. You're bonding Someone who's not your spouse, not your husband, not your wife. And so we love people, but we put boundaries, boundaries on those relationships. Number four. Remember, I share, I'm sharing this with candidates um, or graduates of ordination. But all of us are subject to the same thing. No matter what what our profession is, when we are interacting with people of the opposite sex who have needs, we are vulnerable to be something to them we're not allowed to be. So number four, it's really quiet in here, but I guess you're not shouting amen on that and that's probably a good thing. So let's look at number four. Whatever you do, do unto the Lord and not for the praise of men. One more time. Whatever you do, do unto the Lord and not for the praise of men. And if you'll do it unto the Lord, you will never, ever quit. Do it for the praise of men. Do it for any other reason. And you will wind up being burnt out, saying, forget it, I'm not doing this anymore. But if you'll do it unto God, you will never be disappointed, ever. We're not a Christian to feed our ego. We're not a Christian to have our emotional needs met. We're not a Christian to gain recognition or fame or money. Well, you don't have to worry about that. We don't enter the ministry, I told the guys, for money because in most cases, you're not going to have what you think you deserve. That's just the result or the reality of ministry. Or we don't enter because of power. No, you know why we do it? Because Philippians 1.21 says this. For to me to live is Christ. And for me to die is gain. This is what we put on my daddy's tombstone. I remember I'm sitting with my mom. And we're saying, what summarizes my dad's life? Now my dad was saved 
when I was three months of age, R.G. Flexen, who was our district superintendent, preached at a camp meeting in Glasper, right behind College Town, uh, when we used to have camp. I was three months of age, and my daddy gave his life to Christ. My daddy is the perfect illustration of Nathaniel. No guile in him. I had a great dad. I, I, I remember when my dad, um, Alzheimer's, was starting to settle in, and I get a call from my mom, and she says, your dad won't shut the hose off. And every time I go to shoot, shut the hose off, he squirts me with a hose. <laughs> so I decided, well, I better go over and, you know, help my mom out. So I got there, and I turned the hose off, and I says to my dad, Dad, what are you doing? Why, why are you running the hose? And he says, I'm trying to get the water out of it. He thought it would just one day, yeah, quit running because he'd get the water out of it. That's how his mechanical Alzheimer's mind worked. I had a marvelous daddy, and we decided to put on his grave what we believed was his life. For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. If we're in this for him, everything else, if we're in this and it's not for him, Everything else is going to disappoint us. But if we're in this and it's for him, he'll not disappoint us. Why? Because Romans 5.5 5 says, and hope does not disappoint us. And we'll sing with the songwriter, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small. When we see Christ, one glimpse of his dear face, what sorrow will he race? So bravely run the race till we see Christ. How many of you know that? Any of you? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Oh, more of you knew it than I thought. Beautiful choir. Great job. So you say to me, Pastor, I want to be a Christian. How? Let's bow our heads. We begin with an A. Admitting the truth about ourselves that our sin separates us from God. We go to B. We believe God did something about it in Christ. C. We commit our lives to Him. Say, I'll be a disciple. I'm going to trust your goodness, not mine. And D, we do it today. Right now where you sit, you can. Just pray this prayer. Say, Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Forgive me for the things I've done that are wrong. I confess to you I'm a, I'm a sinner and I am sorry. Forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. Be my Lord and Savior.